I'm gonna spend a hundred full Minecraft days building a city. See, it's already been almost three years since I made a master plan for my super flat survival world. At the time, many of my projects sat unfinished and sort of disconnected from one another, but I had a vision for a grand city surrounded by a massive mountain range unifying everything in the world. And although I'm definitely proud of all the progress we've made, let's be honest, there's still not much of a city. So today I'm tackling this entire northeast quadrant of the map. We are gonna build as much as possible, starting now. I kicked off day one by beginning construction on a curved road that's gonna connect the top tier of the city to the lower platform. I've designed everything ahead of time in a creative copy of my world, and I'm using a mod called Lightmatica to help me see where everything needs to go. Notice how I'm leaving plenty of space for the houses to go, because I want this road to contain fancy housing for all the people of the city who work at the nearby lumber mill. This brings me to the first great challenge of this project, building diagonally. You see this? This is a building, and over here is another building. They nice and straight, just like in Minecraft. Easy enough, right? But take a look from above and everything changes. Even cities with grids have all sorts of slants. It's what gives a city life. But building diagonally in Minecraft has always been a struggle for me. Like, how do you make a door? <laughs> so as I built the road up over the next few days, I prepared to face my fears head on and build as many diagonal structures as possible. All right, so I think I broke my lumber mill again, which is also my mud and cobble farm. But at least this time, nothing seems to have blown up. I think just the piston conveyors got messed up. So I'm just gonna have to fix this later. Luckily, I had enough mud to finish the walls for our road. And after chopping a bit of acacia wood, the job was finished. I quickly laid out the path for the lower road, which doubles back to reach an even lower tier of the city containing the lonely lumber mill. Don't worry, buddy. Soon you'll have lots of other building friends. On day seven, I set out to give our lumber mill some buddies by starting on the first house. This one isn't actually diagonal, so consider it a bit of a warm up. The further down this road we build, the more slanted the houses are gonna get. I built the house very directly based on the historic 1889 C.A. Belden House in San Francisco, a prime example of one of my favorite architectural styles, Queen and Victorians. We'll talk about them a bit more later in the video. By the end of day eight, I made some great progress and the house basically just needed a roof, which I worked on the next day. I began another one on day 10 and after a long, hard Minecraft day of work, the house was just about finished. On day 11, I wrapped things up by adding a little tower on top and then I powered through the next house. And by this point, things were starting to get pretty slanted. I actually didn't even use reference photos for these last two houses so I could focus more on the diagonal construction. My strategy was to take the normal rectangle of a Minecraft building and start dividing it up into odd sections, sliding things over one block at a time. This split and slide method is something I've used before in my city, like on these shops over at the harbor. It also kind of sounds like the name of a new line dance. To the left. I went to craft some more looms on day 12 and I was able to finish up the third house and then I began constructing a fourth house using that same split and slide technique to create the diagonal. For this one, I took inspiration for the color palette from this house on Carl Street, which is also in San Francisco. Nothing could stop the building train. And I finished the building by the end of day 13 and began house number five the next day. This was the first truly diagonal house. So rather than using the split and slide method, I instead had to establish a diagonal line that felt natural, which was a significant challenge. For houses like this, I would fly way up in the sky, look at the center of my base and try to imagine that the house was like a little slice of the pizza. That probably made no sense, but pizza is cool. After establishing the general shape, I based the form of the building on yet another house from San Francisco, this time from the iconic Alamo Square. This one was built in 1894. Only 90s kids will remember, am I right? The next day I cleaned out my inventory and I cleaned up a few missing details and then I started on house number six at nightfall. For this one, I paid homage to the historic 1891 Corbin Norton house on Martha's Vineyard, an island belonging to my home state of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, the gorgeous color palette called for a bunch of mangrove wood, which is my least favorite wood type to collect, but collect I did and by the end of day 16, I was finished with that house and on to the next. This was the last house with any sort of back to it, by the way. I made a little porch area, which again is straight from the reference. Lecterns are fantastic for railings like this. At this point, I guess I fancied myself as a bit of an architect because I decided to go off reference for this little pink house on day 17. I found that using fences and walls around the windows not only helps mitigate the difficult diagonal building, but it also creates the heavily ornamental look that you see with these Queen Anne's. I ran out of gilded netherrack and I also needed more quartz, so now would be a good time to dive a little deeper into the architecture. So as I mentioned, this style of house is called a Queen Anne Victorian, which is a bit of a confusing name. See, architects have this annoying habit of naming some of their styles after whoever ruled Britain at the time. That's why you may have heard of the Georgian style named after King George, or Edwardian after King Edward, or Jacobian after 
James? Huh. Apparently James in Latin is Jacobus? Just when I thought this couldn't get any more confusing. Anyhow, so right away the name Queen Anne Victorian is confusing. Like, which queen is it? Anne or Victoria? Well, really, Victoria is more accurate. The Victorian era lasted from 1837 to 1901, and most Queen Anne Victorians were built between 1880 and 1901. Which, by the way, is precisely the time period I like to build from in my world. In the UK, there's an entirely different architectural style called Queen Anne that looks nothing at all like the US version. So what happened here? Long story short, some silly Americans built some ornate Victorian houses and didn't know much about architecture, so they called yes. them Queen Anne's, even though they shared almost nothing in common no. with their namesake. They tend to be very ornate, often with big front porches, steeply pitched roofs, and an emphasis on asymmetry. In the 1960s, there was a movement to paint these old Victorians with two to three bright colors in order to accentuate their intricate architectural details. These became known as painted ladies, but they have nothing to do with these butterflies, which are also called painted ladies. There's a famous row of them in San Francisco lining Alamo Square called Postcard Row. Oh, and apparently one of these is the house from Full House? I don't know, man. My head hurts, and I think we've done enough learning for today. Luckily, I got what I needed from the nether, and I was able to start some new buildings by the end of day 18. These two buildings are built at a true 45 degree diagonal line, making them a bit easier than some of the other ones. The pair is based very closely on the historic 1890 Albert Wilford houses, once again in San Francisco. This time we're in the Pacific Heights neighborhood. According to the National Register of Historic Places in San Francisco, these houses are quite unique for their use of an equilateral arched domical bay roof. I think that's these things? I opted to skip out on building the equilateral arch domical bay roofs, but I think the buildings came out pretty good regardless. I finished up on day 19, and on our 20th day, I began house number 10. That's two days per building, not bad at all. For the reference on this next house, we go back again to Massachusetts, this time in Hyde Park, which is a neighborhood of Boston. The unique coloring inspired me to do this blue terracotta trim with the light blue concrete powder, but then for the roof, I decided to go off reference in order to get just a bit more contrast with the other houses when you look at it from above. Too much blackstone can be really overbearing, and I unfortunately can't get deep slate in my super flat world to break it up. I finished the building up on day 21, and I began gathering materials for the last two buildings on the road. This pair's inspiration are two iconic painted ladies at Alamo Square. According to Zillow, this pink one was built for the Harder family in 1899. The renovated home sold for $7.3 million in 2021. The green one appears to have been sold in 2022 for a much more affordable $4.6 million. Suddenly, Wandy T's prices seem reasonable. But luckily, I can build these Minecraft versions for free. Well, I guess that's not quite true, because I ran out of glass and I had to go do a bit of trading. But once I had secured enough glass to finish the project, I was able to spend all of day 23 working on the buildings. The detailing on these was really a delight, even though the diagonal was a bit wonky. The birch and the sandstone work beautifully together against these slightly desaturated terracotta colors, and it just really sells that Queen Anne style. I wrapped up the buildings on day 24, and before I knew it, I was a quarter of the way through the 100 days. One DT stopped by to congratulate me on my progress, but he had nothing good for sale. Bruh. Was needing a break from constructing houses, so I decided to switch things up by heading down to the water to work on some docks. I stopped to collect some mangrove wood on day 26, and then I spent the evening working on the docks and battling mobs. Smaller cargo ships can go into the city harbor, but the narrow passage and shallow water significantly limits the size of the vessels. The Wanderer is about as big as you can fit, so bigger ships will be able to use these docks to drop off some of the larger goods like raw lumber. I will say, this this more industrial, cluttered style of building is very new to me. But people are always asking me how to get better at building, and I think the answer is really the same as with anything else. Go outside your comfort zone. If you only practice what you're already good at, then it's not really practicing now, is it? As the sun went down on day 28, it just really struck me how much progress we've made as I flew towards our city. This could be the most significant transformation my world has ever seen in a single episode. After working on the docks straight through to day 29, I was really running out of spruce wood. And with my lumber mill temporarily out of commission until I had time to sit down and repair it, I was gonna have to collect all all my spruce wood manually. All the trapdoors for the docks ate right through all the wood I had left, and I had no choice but to take a break and chop down some tall spruce trees on day 30. After a bit more work on the docks, I spent the next day refueling. I crafted more rockets, I grabbed some golden carrots, and I moved some of my shulker boxes to a more convenient location. After that, I started a custom oak tree that's gonna act as a buffer between the first house in this row and the hairpin turn in the road. The next morning, I was finally ready to get started on another house. The inspiration for this one takes us to Ocean Grove, New Jersey. This storybook-like, seven-bedroom fantasy masterpiece includes a lush garden out front, which is part of what inspired me to create the custom oak tree. 
I was also inspired by the patterns in the shingles to do these little mangrove slab patterns on the blackstone roof. The reference also inspired me to do this little quartz lined window protruding from the tower roof. I really enjoyed this one and it felt like I was really hitting my stride because at this point I barely noticed I was building slanted at all. On day 34 I wrapped up my 13th house and began construction on a new one. Unfortunately I couldn't find any information on the reference for this next house, but it sure looks nice. I strayed away from the reference a little bit by adding this rooftop porch in order to deal with a tough roof line. Roofs are probably the most difficult part of building on a slant, but they can also be kind of forgiving. Like a lot of the more awkward spots kind of just get filtered out by your imagination, especially at a distance. I broke ground on the 15th house as the sun rose on day 36. The amazing color palette for this one comes straight from this historic 1892 Seattle mansion known as the Madrona Castle. It was built during this population boom that followed the Great Seattle Fire of 1889. These light brown shingles you see in some of the photos of the house inspired me to use spruce wood for the roof, and I think that was the perfect choice. On day 36, the house was finished and I was feeling amazing about how the road was looking. These big path block squares are actually the slime chunks in my city. The path blocks disable them from spawning and then when I go to build in the area, I can kind of blend the ground enough that they don't stand out too much. There's a few examples of this throughout the city already. Wandy T stopped by again on day 38 and I bought some tropical fish from him and then got back to work on the paths. The next day I was ready to go back to building so I began working on the biggest houses yet. I'm imagining that most of the people in the houses we've been building are either office workers for the lumber mill or the docks, or they work on the upper level of the city where I'll be putting government buildings like a post office, a town hall, and a library. The houses closest to the mill probably belong to its wealthy owners, which is why we're going a bit bigger and more extravagant. The one I'm building now is inspired by the Albert H. Beach House, built in 1896, not even 10 years after the town of Escondido that it sits in was incorporated. So basically my Minecraft world is older than the town was when they built the house. This house in particular really made me wish we had a green wood type. Please Mojang, it would be so awesome, please. Instead I was forced to use the warped wood, which strays quite a bit from the reference, but I think it works okay nonetheless. After a couple trips to the nether for warped wood and blackstone, the building was finished by day 43. I'm using white terracotta for this next one, but unfortunately I don't have any in stock at Macy's, the home of my Mason villagers. I'm only able to buy 48 blocks per day, so it might take a little while to finish. Even though I'm using white terracotta, my main inspiration is called the Pink Lady, otherwise known as the J. Milton Carson House. This lovely house was built in 1889 in Eureka, California, just across the street from the Carson Mansion, which is perhaps the most famous Queen Anne Victorian, other than maybe the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. William Carson, the rich guy who lived in the Carson Mansion, had the Pink Lady constructed for his son as a wedding present. I don't think I even brought a present to the last wedding I went to. Now I feel terrible. Maybe when 1.20 rolls around, I'll add some cherry wood to the house and make it a little bit more pink. But with the pink blocks in the game at the moment, I just couldn't really find a good option. These bigger houses are really fun to do, especially after doing all the skinny row houses. I feel like I have space to spread out and really explore this Victorian style. Between gathering the granite, the quartz, and the terracotta, progress on this house was relatively slow and the days were just flying by. So on day 48, I began construction on the final Queen Anne house. We can work on this while I wait for the materials I need to finish our Pink Lady replica. I'll be doing plenty more buildings, but most of them from here on out will be shops and offices. For this last one, I wanted to try more of a classic brick construction rather than the vibrant painted lady style. Coincidentally, two different buildings from the same town came up in my online research. Details on these houses were pretty scarce online. I'm not sure if they might have had the same architect or if there's any relation between them at all. But I found it quite fun to work with the enormous diagonal porch and I'm pretty happy with how the building came out. Afterwards, I finished up that little gazebo and I made several passes on all the houses, adding any remaining missing blocks I could find. I continued tidying up for the next few days and I tried lighting up a bit as well. I also want to add vegetation where possible, so I worked on a big cut custom spruce tree. Also, mobs were starting to get pretty frustrating, so I pretended to promise myself to get better at lighting things up. Once again, I relocated my shulker boxes on day 54, and the next day I was done cleaning things up and ready to continue building. I gave myself a break from all the diagonal building with this quirky little drug store. This is the kind of place that would have a big counter inside with a soda fountain and sell things like candy, cigars, and lipstick. I can't wait to do the interior for this in the future. I have so many ideas. These little banners take forever to do, but they really complete the old time. Love. 
fuck. With the banners done, I was ready to move on to another building. I knew I wanted one on this corner, but I wasn't sure what to build at first. But I figured since the cemetery is just down the stairs, it would make sense to build some sort of morgue or mortuary. I tried to make it look rather official, so it stood out as sort of a scholarly structure. The interior for this one is also gonna be super fun. The next day, I added a few more custom trees around the area, and then I started working on an office building for the lumber mill on day 59. It took me all of day 60 and the morning of day 61 to finish it off. And despite my best efforts, I still had a lot of lighting up to do. On day 62, I built a little oak tree behind the new office, and then I began a new building in the center of the lumber yard. I'm imagining this one to be sort of like a combination warehouse and office. I'm adding a bit more texture variation to these work buildings, since they're gonna have a little bit more wear and tear, and they're just not gonna be as well kept as the houses. After finishing the green building, I started working on a big flag to fly over the mortuary. It's an enlarged version of this banner I came up with to represent the city. The design kind of matches the carpet in the tower, but it also represents this obelisk I'm planning on building in the temple. On day 64, I started building an extra big version of the flags on the east and the west sides of the temple. I tried to texture them as much as possible to make them look like worn fabric and avoid them becoming too cartoonish looking. After I finished the flags, I spent the rest of day 65 beginning another road for the city. This one will connect up to what's currently this dead end and provide a way to get down from the top level. On day 66, I stopped to cook some more stone bricks and then I began working on the walls of the road. For the gradient, I've chosen, I'm gonna need to trade for a bunch of cyan terracotta, and I'll also need to chop some acacia wood. The next day, I decided to do another house, probably for the family that runs the drugstore. I'm trying to do more of a simplistic floor plan that still fits in with the other dwellings in the area in terms of color palette. I needed some more warped wood, so I headed to the nether and then finished up the house on day 68. After finishing up the house, it was back to work on the road, and this work continued throughout the next three days. I chose to leave the inside edge of the road unfinished for now. I'd like to eventually build a big opera house that's gonna take up most of the available space on this level, but nope. that's gonna have to wait for a future episode. With the road done, I decided to try something very new on day 72. I added some blackstone birds above the city. I'm so in love with how these birds came out. I really hope you guys like them too. Next up, I started building a circular section of dock, which I worked on for all of day 73. I wanna add a lot more structures to the dock, so I started working on a new one up top to help ease the transition into the dock area. I also started the foundations of some buildings down on the docks themselves. Over the next several days, I jumped from building to building, slowly collecting any missing resources and building everything up. I had to take tons of little breaks to collect various materials, but by day 78, I had wrapped up most of the buildings in progress and I could focus on combing through for any missing details like barrels or pipes. I'm hoping once I do all the interiors, this entire region is just gonna be so full of life. Next, I turn my attention to the lumber yard. I wanna add a lot more machinery and infrastructure to make this place feel more like a bustling work yard. I added this big gear thing and it's starting to add that industrial feel to this area. Another thing I always mention when people ask me how to get better at building is that you need to collaborate. I totally hit a mental block when it came to this steampunk industrial style, so I hit up my good friend Shovel241. Just hopping on a call with him and building for a bit was enough to give me the confidence to complete this area. That's not how I remember it, Mog. I built all this for you. Cut, cut the tape. Huge shout out to Shovel, go subscribe to him. I spent day 83 working on a loading dock to finish off the back of the lumber mill, which has sat unfinished in my world for far too long now. I gotta finish this little uh, face of the building and then I also need to do the back here. The back is a sight for sore eyes. Um, that's not how you use that expression, is it? Well, you know what I mean. The next day I created this basin to help transport logs and other cargo either into the mill or towards the storehouse. And the day after that I filled the basin with water and created some more infrastructure around it. I'm so happy with how it looks so far. I even made this little telegraph wire between the main dock office and the lumber mill. Now they can send cheeky little messages to each other like SpongeBob and Patrick with the bubbles. On day 86 I did some work on that dock office building, but it requires me to trade for cyan terracotta, so progress on this building is gonna be very gradual. I also built the elevator platform itself out of a bunch of campfires, and then I spent the next day working more on the loading dock area. Once again, as I was flying back towards the city, the magnitude of everything we've built so far really just hit me. You could honestly title any of my videos Adult Man Made Weirdly Emotional by His Own Minecraft Builds, and that would be pretty accurate. But when you've spent as long as I have in the same world, it somehow feels reasonable. I buckled down on finishing up all the infrastructure around the lumber mill, and by the end of day 90, I was pretty happy to call it somewhat finished. With only 10 days left to go, I decided decided to focus on making the docks feel more full. 
I started this red building that's sort of half on the docks, half on the city platform. On day 93, I built some more small trees and I addressed some of the unfinished dock supports. Who couldn't use a little more support, you know? <laughs> the next day, I started this little house on the spiral road with basement access to the docks. And the next day after that, I built another small house next to it. After everything I've learned from designing the complicated diagonal Queen Anne's, these smaller dwellings feel like a total breeze and they get us a lot closer to that cluttered look we're going for. I was able to finish the buildings and go back to adding little details to the dock, like this newsstand. The next day I kept adding details and I realized I really need to finish that dock office, so I traded for as much cyan terracotta as I could and chipped away at it. Afterwards, I started making a little black market area on the docks. I kept working as hard as I could, wrapping up all the dock supports on day 98 and trying to finish off any missing detail I could find. Identifying and adding in all the missing details can be quite time consuming, and before I knew it, I was on day 100. I went ahead and I built this little spot for a hanging billboard. Maybe you guys can help me decide what goes there. I also started one last building on the docks, but as the sun went down, I just had to accept that 100 days was now over, but I just couldn't help myself. So I spent another two and a half hours working as hard as I could to finish the dock area to the best of my ability. I went totally crazy with the details and it was definitely worth it. If you guys like this type of video, I'll do 100 days of interiors and I'll make an interior for every single one of the houses. And maybe I'll even do some interior work at my nether hub and my end base. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching.